On Nationwide this evening, we commemorate the lockout of 1913. The story of that six month long bitter dispute between workers and employers is retold in theatre, in tapestry and by relatives of those involved. Dublin in the early 1900s was steeped in poverty, hardship, misery, with death rates almost as high as the likes of Calcutta. Having fallen behind more industrialised centres like Belfast, Liverpool and Manchester, the city had more than its fair share of unskilled workers. And harsh working conditions prompted James Larkin, a Liverpool Irishman, to set up the ITGWU in 1909. It was based in the old building on the site of Liberty Hall, here behind me. I think what transformed the situation was Larkin and his message of hope that if people came together, worked together, fought together for their rights, they could actually change the world. One of the biggest employers in Dublin at the time was William Martin Murphy, chairman of the Tramway Company, Ireland's first newspaper baron, and one of the most prominent entrepreneurs of the time. He saw Larkin and Larkinism and socialism as representing all that was most evil in the world, and he decided he'd have to smash this union to basically save um, Irish capitalism, if you like. When Larkin began organising workers in Murphy's Tramway Company, Murphy proceeded to sack anybody who was in Larkin's union. Hundreds of men were sacked from the company and Larkin sanctioned a strike, planning to bring the city of Dublin to a standstill. However, Murphy got wind of this plan and he was well prepared with replacement staff. Murphy drafted in hundreds of police to help protect his companies uh, and rioting broke out in the city in protest to the police brutality. This protest became known as Bloody Sunday. Here on O'Connell Street, which of course was known as Sackville Street back then, up to 600 people were injured. The very next day, the TUC met in Manchester and Larkin got the green light of support from Britain. So overnight, the situation was transformed from a local dispute between tram drivers and conductors into an international one about union recognition. Murphy persuaded all the other employers in Dublin to lock out their men who were in the transport union and to get all their other employees to sign a declaration saying, hey, they weren't in the union and they wouldn't associate with it. And thousands of workers on principle refused to sign that. So what began as a tramway strike within a week had become a strike involving about 25,000 workers and their families. Most of those families lived in tenements in Dublin's inner city. Once the houses of the ruling elite Ironically, they became the slums of Dublin 1913. In one house here in Henrietta Street alone, the 1911 census reported that there were 19 families living under the one roof. Now, conditions may have been harsh before the lockout started, but when it dragged on for almost six months, hunger and poverty developed a violence of their own. I wonder how much I'd get for the bed. I'm not selling it now. I just wonder what it's worth. We weren't always like this, you know. We're respectable people. There's over 100 people living in this house, all respectable people. And myself and Tommy are good, hard-working, honest Catholics. Not like some of them you find across the street. Protestants. We wanted to live like the gentry. That's why we chose this place. <laughs> Silly, I suppose. I don't imagine the gentry that once lived here going down to Capel Street to buy their bonnet second hand, now pawning their belongings of a Monday to pay for the rent. Tommy wants me to try and sell this bed now. It's all we have left worth anything. Laura Murray there in the Dublin Tenement Experience, which runs until next Saturday. Another person who lived in this house, 14 Henrietta Street, around the time of the lockout, was Rosie Hackett, the girl with the revolutionary spirit. Who is Rosie Hackett? So that was my big question. Uh, I knew she was a Jacobs girl. I knew that it really started with a simple no for her, and that's why I was really interested in her. 13 is a series of interconnecting works 
that looks at the uh, events of the 1913 Dublin lockout as they unfold in present day Dublin and build incrementally from the 9th of September until the 21st of September, uh, day by day. Suasion is really about the fight of the kind of more lesser known figures of the lockout in, in their lockout. And one of those people was the uh, kind of endearing and wonderful Rosie Hackett. Rosie just simply refused to take off her red badge in Jacobs, and that's where her, you might say, her life ended and began. Um, from that point on, she went down to Liberty Hall and found her footing with the other Jacob girls. They joined in in the soup kitchens to feed the poor, and then her union life began, which carried her on right through 1916. Katrina Ennis there in Lockout 13, which opens on the 9th of September as part of Dublin's Fringe Festival. Meanwhile, the National Library is drawing on its own historical archives to commemorate the events of 1913. There's an interesting photo a week after Bloody Sunday, thousands on O'Connell Street and no violence. It's very important when you look at this photograph, which is of a peaceful demonstration on O'Connell Street, to remember that just a week before there were huge riots. Um, which shocked the city of Dublin and which shocked international opinion. What this suggests to us is that if the police had not intervened quite so forcibly, that Bloody Sunday may never have happened. Children suffered terribly during the lockout, Catherine. They were literally starving. If you have somewhere between 20,000 and 25,000 men out of work, you have nearly 100,000 dependents with literally no way of feeding themselves. So families were thinking about placing their children in foster families in the UK. However, the church was extremely unhappy because they feared that children might be placed with Protestant or even atheist families. And so you had terrible scenes at the docks where priests and clergy were intervening to try to prevent children from being sent to where they might have been well fed. That exhibition will run at the National Library here in Dublin until March of next year. Now, the lockout was defined by the collective action of the men and women of Dublin in trying to secure a better deal for ordinary workers. And as part of a project run by SIP2 and the National College of Art and Design, Anne Casson has been to meet some men and women who've come together now to revisit that story in the form of a magnificent tapestry. The whole aim was to involve other people in this and in this process explore their own past and, and what, what, what happened at the time. And right from the start it was going to be a narrative. We felt it had to be a narrative that we do them as a graphic novel in blocks of three or four and they tell the story. These are the best dressed factory workers I've ever seen. The tapestry was designed by artists Cathy Henderson and Robert Bala. Porig attempted to do a kind of reduced version of the story and then Cathy and myself went off to do the images to, to suit that narrative which we then handed over in terms of full-size drawings to the volunteers. And the volunteers include members of the Patchwork Society, the Embroidery Guild, the ICA, prisoners and other community groups in Dublin, Limerick, Waterford and Galway. I see the ladies are working very hard here Mary Thank you, um, you've yeah. done a lot of work on this panel where is it in the uh, overall tapestry where does it come it's the main panel in the overall scheme it's the only one that's round and the rest of them are all oblong or square mm -hmm. and quite small Larkin's figure was taken back in 1923 I think and he has his wonderful Dublin behind him the work involved in the uh, preparation of this panel. I know you've been working on it for over a year. Mm, since June 12 months ago. Every Tuesday morning, the five of us, for hours on end. Mm. And we enjoyed it no end. We, we loved coming in, loved sewing. And who's done the, the suit, his I, clothing? I, I, I dressed him. Um, <laughs> after much deliberation, we had him dressed in all sorts of different colour browns. But the committee had to, we'd dress them and the committee would have to check, no, they wouldn't like it. So between the jigs and the reels, we ended up with just plain brown. And uh, the work on his face is incredibly delicate and Absolutely intricate. Absolutely brilliant. I was dreading the thought of who was going to ask who to do the face, but Bernie was wonderful. Bernie did his face and his hands. <laughs> She's so 
Ina, you completed this panel mm -hmm. today and brought it in today? Today, delivered today. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell me a little bit about uh, the James Connolly figure and why you were given this image. Well, I choose to do this one. I just liked it. I love James Connolly. And this is little Alice Brady's funeral. She was shot and she died. And James Connolly did the narration at her funeral, so hence. And are you delighted with your work? Are you proud of it? I'm very, very proud of it, yeah. Very proud to be part of the project. Like, it, it's a super bit of history. Really proud. Valerie, what element of the 1913 lockout does your panel represent? Well, it represents the Jacobs, um, uh, the problem that these ladies had um, when they wore the badges which were supporting the, the strikers and when they wore the badges into work, they were fired. There's going to be a text. We'll say. Yes. Okay. These ladies, the same day the disturbances began outside Jacobs Fisk factory, as women workers wearing the red hand badges of the ITGWU are turned away. Okay. And may I ask what does this Well, represent? I haven't seen these. These, uh, we thought they were biscuits, but oh. apparently, <laughs> they should be biscuits, but apparently they're little medallions oh, that medallion. will, yes. little medallions, and I think they're being done by the rehab. We're doing certain discs that are going into that panel, and um, there are different pictures of different things, different symbols and stuff of the time. Down the road in Dublin 8, we met some members of RAID, recovery through arts, drama and education. Well, before um, the unions came in and told us about it, I didn't really know anything about the history of the lockout. And um, so we really got interested in it. And we done all our research, Googling all the history about it, and then um, came up with drawings of our own ideas of what we would like to do around the lockout. My one is of the children uh, back at, during the lockout. There, there was uh, women and that that would uh, give out soup and that to children. So I've got uh, a woman outside. This is like Liberty Hall. That's um, start of just the wall and a bit of the window to do. And uh, she's giving soup out to the children, you know. Okay. I just made up on my head and, and just started sewing it. You know? And it's in Liberty Hall that the completed panels are currently stored for safekeeping. This one shows Larkin in prison um, uh, in, in October 1913. Uh, there'll be a panel here with narrative on it explaining what's involved. Uh, and, uh, this one now, this is uh, one of the early panels. It shows Lord Aberdeen and his wife arriving at the Dublin Horse Show. It's based on a real photograph from the period. This is the a badge of the Union at the time, the, the third quarter of 1913, so that's hence the three. Uh, this is the food kitchen, which was in Liberty Hall, the basement of the old Liberty Hall on this site, and uh, this was made with wool. It's a bit different from the others. Uh, all the techniques are varied, but again, it shows people being fed in, the, uh, in Liberty Hall. This one is... Uh, Larkin at the Asquith Tribunal in Dublin Castle giving evidence on behalf of the trade union movement. And that was a phrase he used at the time, uh, Christ will not be crucified in Dublin. This is um, a really interesting panel. In fact, it's the final uh, panel in the piece. And the idea behind it is to create a kind of connection in the narrative, because the very first panel shows Larkin and a few of his comrades and they're founding the union and they have just a little candle on the table. So the idea was that from that little spark, you know, the flame of justice and of hope had been lit and would not be extinguished. Because even though the workers were forced to go back to work and in many ways that was seen as a defeat. Within a very short period of time the transport union had over a hundred thousand members. So that's the idea behind this and we got uh, school children to embroider all these little panels which are all joined together to create a fitting end to the whole uh, narrative. The whole group has really stepped up to the challenge you know and um, 
but it will be recognised by the whole country when the time comes to exhibit and all, you know, so it's really something to look forward to. Like, it's, it's all part of, of who I am and, and who all, you know, all of us are as Irish people. The tapestry with its 30 panels will be launched on the 18th of September in Liberty Hall, appropriate location. From there, it goes to Collins Barracks and then to the NCAD in Thomas Street. Well, now, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, the Dublin employer who sided with the workers during the lockout in 1913. We'll talk to you again in a couple of minutes.